So today I will be talking about uh, 5G and 6G. Uh, I'm uh, happy to see that at least compared to 10 minutes ago, there's like uh, 10 times more people here. Very happy about that. Uh, one thing before we start, this uh, talk will not be about the detailed technical aspects of 5G or 6G. Now that will take about 40 hours, not 40 minutes. So this will be more of an overall uh, uh, situation surrounding uh, 5G, the landscape, how it's changing. Uh, 6G, again, you know, what's the uh, trends going into 6G, those type of things. So you can think of it, uh, think of this as a more of a general uh, discussion. Okay, so some thoughts on 5G. So when we first started uh, 5G, this was back in 2009 or 2010, about 10 years ago. What we started out was like uh, how we start out many other things. We came up with a vision. So back then, this is actually a, a material that I uh, copied from uh, uh, about uh, eight or nine years ago. We first developed, okay, with 5G, what can we do? And these are some of the things that at that time we thought would be important for 5G. Everything on cloud. So uh, terminals, without having to have fast storage capacity or ha uh, having to do uh, complex uh, computations, uh, they would just uh, rely on uh, the, the cloud to do that and using wireless connection, just get the uh, results uh, transferred over to them. Immersive uh, experience, this would be your uh, virtual reality, your uh, augmented reality, high definition uh, videos, these type of things. Again, in order to make this happen, what would be very important is high data rate uh, wireless transfer as well as very low latency. And then connectivity. Connectivity is basically uh, the support of IoT from the wireless uh, perspective. Uh, even now, the uh, IoT terminals that we have is as large as the uh, size of the uh, human population. Now, going forward, this is expected to be uh, several times larger, actually dozens of times larger in the uh, coming years. So how do we connect these devices to the wireless network? That, that is another question that we have to uh, kind of challenge ourselves. And of course, for this, connectivity would be the most important thing as well as uh, extending the coverage because some of the terminals for these IoT devices, they will not be uh, uh, moving around. They will be uh, in ground or, or blocked by uh, obstacles. So how do we uh, provide coverage for these uh, terminals? That was the question that we had. And then telepresence. This is something uh, like uh, you're not physically there, but it's as if you are there. So this would allow you to uh, control uh, vehicles or machinery uh, in a remote control sense uh, of a manner. So for this, again, you need very high data rate and very low latency. And this uh, slide actually is what uh, the current 5G uh, commercial deployments are now starting to reflect. As you can see, it's not much different from what we had as a vision about 10 years ago. So things we are, we are currently uh, uh, discussing in terms of 5G service scenarios are Internet of Things, mobile cloud service, uh, virtual reality remote uh, machine control, mobile giga internet service, autonomous driving and B2X, wireless backhaul service. So these are currently uh, either deployed or being planned as a future deployment. Okay, so in order to make uh, 5G happen, uh, a couple of years ago, I, ITU developed uh, eight KPIs, key performance indices, and these were generated so that you know, uh, 5G would have a target to uh, be uh, designed against. Uh, and the eight KPIs are basically the peak data rate, the user experience data rate, uh, spectral efficiency, mobility, latency, uh, connection density, network energy efficiency, area traffic capacity. And as you can see from the uh, figure to the left, 5G in every metric surpasses what 4G can achieve. And in addition to these eight KPIs, three key service areas were defined. ENBB, which stands for Enhanced Mobile Broadband. You can think of this as your uh, typical uh, smartphone uh, experience. What would be very important is uh, how to realize very, very high data rate. Now with EMBB, uh, the applications would be things like high definition uh, videos, virtual reality, augmented reality, and so on. 
and then URRC. URRC, I guess, is one of the key things that kind of differentiate uh, 5G from 4G. So URRC stands for ultra reliable and low latency communications. So two things, latency and reliability. So in terms of latency, 4G supports a uh, air latency of about 10 milliseconds. Now 5G, the target was to reduce this uh, by uh, tenfold, so one millisecond air latency. This would allow uh, new applications such as remote robot control, connected automotive uh, vehicles, for example, vehicular safety, uh, interactive gaming, and so on. And then, of course, MMPC. And uh, as I'm, uh, MMPC stands for massive machine type communications, and this, of course, has to do with IoT. How many devices uh, can you connect simultaneously? And the target uh, in this case was to uh, simultaneously connect uh, one million devices per square kilometer. Okay, and this slide basically uh, summarizes the evolution of wireless uh, technologies starting from 2G all the way until 5G. So uh, no, no need to, I, I'm not going to discuss the key technologies because of course this will take time and, and uh, I, I don't think the, uh, it's not my intention to go into the details. So if we look at 2G first, what's uh, uh, important about 2G is that it's the first digital cellular wireless system. Before 2G, it was all analog. And starting from 2G, things turned into di digital. And 3G, the key thing is uh, packet data service was added on top of voice for the first time. That's the key aspect of 3G. And 4G, uh, while 3G supported some data uh, support, it was only in 4G that things actually turned all IP-based, high packet uh, data, uh, service oriented. And then in 5G, of course, as I mentioned before, we have our EMBB, MMPC, URRC. They have all higher requirements that uh, uh, compared to 4G, and 5G basically was designed to meet these uh, requirements. Now, uh, in terms of limitations, 2G, there's only voice. So there's no vertically, uh, no data uh, support or packet data support. 3G, while there was packet data support, because of the limited bandwidth that 3G had, you could only achieve a certain uh, data rate. Uh, things like uh, uh, above uh, tens of uh, megabps would be uh, unrealistic for 3G. And then going into 4G, uh, although uh, 4G kind of uh, addressed many of the issues that uh, 3G had, there were two key issues that uh, 4G had uh, on its own. Uh, number one was it can only be deployed in uh, frequency band lower than six gigahertz. Now the issue with this is wireless data traffic is exploding. It's exploding. But with only the, by only using uh, spectrum under six gigahertz, there's only so much you can do. You cannot address this uh, exploding uh, wireless traffic. The second thing, uh, the second limitation that 4G has is that this packet data capability in 4G was designed to uh, design as a one-size-fits-all solution. So regardless if the uh, data is streaming, messaging, or FTP, you have the same architecture to address this. Now, while this was okay for 4G, in 5G, things, the, the, uh, the characteristics of the data got very, very diverse, and because of that, in 5G, we needed to address this. And as I mentioned, there was two uh, limitations in 4G. For the uh, sub six gigahertz limitation, 4G solved that by uh, coming up with an air interface that can also be deployed above six gigahertz, for example, 28 gigahertz in US. And then for the uh, one size fits all uh, uh, packet data architecture, uh, 5G, uh, developed and specified a service-based architecture that's customizable. So that, those two are the key things uh, that's different uh, from 5G going on uh, uh, from 4G. So what is customizable service-based architecture? So this slide actually was intended to uh, kind of illustrate the difference between uh, the different approach that 5G is taking towards service. So if you look at 2G, it's about voice. So there's only one service. So 
you know, the, the notion of uh, having to uh, optimize for different uh, services didn't exist. But then going into 3G, you have your voice and data. However, again, in this case, this data uh, architecture was designed to uh, meet the requirements of all different uh, uh, wireless traffics. And 4G actually took, the, took things one step further. Even voice was integrated within the uh, data packet framework. But then uh, later down the road, uh, during the 4G times, companies realized that uh, having this type of a one, uh, one size fits all solution for data uh, might not be such a good idea. We needed to have a solution that was kind of dedicated uh, for a certain traffic type. And that traffic type was IoT. Uh, in the latter stage of uh, 4G, IoT came uh, into the picture. And IoT had two very interesting characteristics. One is that the IoT uh, data tends to have very diverging uh, traffic characteristic. In some cases, the data rate could be very, very low, and the latency would not matter. Uh, in other cases, the data rate might be very high, and lat latency was very, very critical. So if we were to uh, uh, address this type of uh, uh, data along with uh, traditional uh, mobile broadband data, we ended up uh, sacrificing efficiency. So th this was one reason uh, people began to think that a dedicated uh, uh, network slice might be better to address IoT data. And then the other reason was uh, the owners of these uh, IoT data, for example, your utility companies or uh, smart factories, they had concerns about security. They did not want their data to be mixed with other uh, mobile broadband data for reasons of security. So they kind of demanded, okay, we want our data to be uh, uh, treated in a separate uh, uh, slice of the network. So that's why in 4G, uh, 3GPP came up with this uh, IoT decor or IoT dedicated core. This is a virtual uh, network slice that is de uh, dedicated specifically for IoT. Now in 5G, of course, uh, 3GPP took this step uh, even further, and then uh, what we ended up having is this optimized support for different services. So it's not just about IoT in 5G. You can have a dedicated network function for uh, URLC, NMTC, uh, EMDB, as long as someone's paying for this, of course. Okay, and uh, next few slides, I will talk about the, uh, uh, the ecosystem, how the ecosystem of the mobile industry is changing. So this picture uh, shows the traditional uh, ecosystem of the mobile industry. What you have is chipset vendors supplying the terminal vendors and terminal vendors uh, coming up with the terminal and then supplying that to the uh, mobile network operators. And network vendors, of course, also uh, make network equipments and supply the uh, mobile network operator. And network, uh, uh, mo uh, mobile network operator basically uh, comes to you and me, we sign a contract, we pay them money, and that's how they make the money. Now this has been the uh, ecosystem of the mobile industry uh, since uh, uh, the very first beginning. And, and this has been so uh, to uh, many parts uh, for 2G, 3G, and 4G, even 4G. Now, however, for 5G, things began to change a bit. Uh, and, and, and again, uh, at the heart of this change is IoT. So there's two things I would like to mention about IoT. One, the sheer number of IoT devices. Even now, the number of IoT devices in the world is about the same as the human population. In the next five or six years, it's expected that the number of IoT devices will be triple the number of human population. And it's continuing to uh, uh, grow and grow. Number two, uh, although uh, we group these uh, uh, devices as IoT, there's actually a lot of uh, different industry uh, sectors involved. Uh, we can have industrial IoT, where we have uh, utility companies, manufacturers, smart cities, retail, fleet management, and, and smart buildings. We have consumer IoT, where we have uh, companies involved in wearables, vehicles, uh, smart TV, uh, game consoles, set-top boxes, and smart homes. So it's a whole range of different industries 
under the uh, umbrella of IoT. And then the fourth industrial revolution. Well, we have your IoT, and they're producing huge amount of data, and AI is processing this data. So what we end up having is machines are now demanding much more than humans in terms of wireless traffic. It, they, they are demanding more in terms of bandwidth, reliability, and latency. So, and they are being connected on a massive scale on various forms. This is what's happening right now. So because of these uh, changes, the ecosystem has also changed now. So compared to the traditional uh, ecosystem that we have uh, to the left, we now have newcomers coming in. They want to have a say on how the uh, mobile uh, uh, technology is to be developed. For example, uh, 5GAA. This is a consortium of uh, auto, uh, automobile industry companies such as uh, Audi, Daimler, uh, BMW. So these companies are coming into the wireless uh, technology sector and uh, telling, uh, telling the wireless people, okay, for vehicular communication, this is what I want you to develop. This is my requirement. The same thing is happening for 5G ACIA, which is basically a consortium of companies involved in uh, smart factory. And these companies are coming into the wireless sector and telling us, telling the people, okay, for industrial IoT, I want these kind of features. These are the important KPIs for me. And we have governments. Governments are involved, uh, interested in uh, public safety networks, and they have their own requirements how the wireless system should be designed. So compared to before, where it was uh, simply the terminal vendor, the network vendor, and the mobile uh, uh, network operator that were involved in the industry, uh, now we see a lot of newcomers coming in, uh, having their say, uh, trying to make an influence. Uh, and, and this, uh, I, I'm expecting this to continue as we move forward to even 6G. So, just to summarize, 5G is expected to su uh, support much more verticals and services compared to 4G. Now, if you look at uh, 2G and 3G, it, it, 2G and 3G was mostly about communication between human and human. Now, if you go to 4G, it, this was expanded to include human to machine communication. Uh, what you do uh, when you access uh, mobile internet, that's uh, talking to a machine, a server. Now for 5G, we expect this to expand to machine-to-machine -to -machine communications. Basically, you are not involved. It's your machines that are talking to each other. Now, if you compare the, the volume of data generated by human-to-human, human-to-machine, and machine-to-machine, machine-to-machine would be the largest by far. After that would be human-to-machine, and human to human, of course, would, not, uh, would be quite small compared to these, three, these two. And the impact of uh, this uh, uh, verticals will be felt across a very diverse uh, uh, industry sectors, your agriculture, retail, finance, public safety, healthcare, and so on. So it will be quite far reaching. Okay. So uh, after this, uh, I would like to spend some time uh, talking about uh, how uh, Samsung uh, made 5G a reality in, uh, from our own point of view. There was one thing that Samsung was the first to uh, propose, and let me give you an introduction on that. So how 5G started in Samsung? This started from a quite simple question. How do we get a 10 times improvement over LTE or 4G? Now, at least from data rate perspective, you cannot get a ten, 10 times improvement over existing technology without one fundamental thing, and that is spectrum. And 4G relied solely on spectrum below 6 gigahertz. What we realized is because this spectrum in, uh, below 6G is so scarce, if we continue with that trend, there's no way we can get a 10 times improvement. So we looked upwards, and our answer for that was millimeter wave. So millimeter wave is spectrum uh, starting from 30 gigahertz all the way until 300 gigahertz. The good news is there is an abundance of uh, frequency resource in this spectrum. 
the bad news is channel propagation properties are very bad over here. And uh, let me just introduce why this is so. Uh, one thing I would like to apologize is for the equations. <laughs> but this is the only equations I have. And uh, for, for those, of, th those of you who majored in uh, EE, uh, this is the freeze uh, uh, equation, so nothing fancy. The only thing I want to say here is, as, we, as the carrier frequency goes up, the effective uh, area with which the antenna can use to capture uh, RF energy decreases. And the rate of decrease is proportional to the square of carrier frequency. So if your carrier frequency goes up by 10 times, it means that the, uh, the area with which you can capture RF energy becomes 100 times smaller. So the uh, illustration to the right basically uh, shows the uh, comparison between 2.8 gigahertz and the uh, 28 gigahertz. So by going 10 times up, the antenna size, the antenna aperture size has now become 100 times smaller. This is why uh, going up in carrier frequency is challenging. However, the good thing, I, I'm not sure I can say it's a good thing, but at least, uh, one good aspect of this is because the antenna size has now gotten smaller, what we can do is we can put together more antennas. And this actually achieves the same thing as having one big antenna. So this is uh, how we made uh, uh, this uh, millimeter wave wireless technology work. By putting together a lot of antennas, small antennas together, you open up uh, one of these millimeter wave base stations or millimeter wave uh, uh, terminals and you'll see the small antennas in there. Uh, and and for, to further uh, increase the performance of uh, this millimeter wave uh, communication system, you can also use transmit uh, beamforming. Transmit beamforming is to focus the energy at, from the transmitter side to a certain direction instead of uh, transmitting in an omnidirectional uh, manner. So that nice beam over there is an illustration of transmit beamforming. So theoretically, what is possible is by combining uh, transmit beamforming and a lot of small antennas, you could overcome uh, the challenges of millimeter wave. However, this is uh, theory, this is uh, computer simulations. The key thing, I guess, is does it work in real life? And that's why starting from 2013 all the way until 2018, we did an extensive uh, work on field trials uh, test beds, and so on. So we did this for two uh, different setups. One, uh, one was the fixed uh, wireless access case where both the transmitter and the receiver are on fixed locations. And then we also took this and did for a uh, mobile wireless access setup where the transmitter is fixed, but the terminal itself is on a vehicle, either a car, a train, uh, or so on. And I guess I just mentioned the uh, first uh, test bed we had. This was back in 2013. This is when we uh, tested uh, millimeter wave for the first time. And uh, in this occasion, we uh, showed that a data rate of one gigabps can be achieved over a distance of one kilometer or more. And this is using uh, 28 gigahertz uh, spectrum. So I think this was the first time uh, uh, anyone has shown that a, such a high data rate was possible uh, for this uh, channel uh, over such a big distance. Then in 2000, uh, after that, we showed that the data rate can even go up until 7.9 uh, gigabps. For the mobile cases, basically we showed uh, this beam tracking, this transmit, uh, uh, transmit beam forming can track uh, even high speed vehicular mo movement uh, with speeds uh, going up until over uh, 60 miles an hour, uh, you know, uh, when the terminal is on top of a moving train and so on and so forth. Okay, and because of uh, our work on uh, this millimeter wave band, this is the landscape of uh, 5G spectrum that you see uh, today. Actually, the data is from 2018, but I think that's not much different, so I think it should be okay. Now, compared to the 4G uh, spectrum case, two, 
things, one thing is uh, very, very different. In 4G, the spectrum was focused exclusively on the sub-6 gigahertz uh, spectrum band. Now in 6G, we have both the sub-6 spectrum for 5G and the above-6 spectrum for 5G. For the sub-6, 3.5 gigahertz, which is currently commercialized already in Korea and expect to, to be commercialized in areas like Japan, China, is one of the uh, more popular bands. For the above uh, 6 gigahertz, 28 gigahertz, which is, I believe, uh, commercialized in US, is one of the uh, more popular bands. And Korea has also uh, been uh, allocated this uh, spectrum uh, for 5G as well. And I, I think it's also happening in Japan as well. Okay, so before we move on to the next topic, I just want to share this uh, couple of uh, pictures that I found very in interesting uh, over the uh, course of uh, a couple of years. Uh, now, this 5G technology was made by a group of 2000, over 2,000 engineers, standards wireless experts uh, in 3GPP. Now, in order to make a, a specification, you debate a lot. You debate on and on and on until the next guy gives up before you. <laughs> so you have to have a lot of discussions. And the way you have discussions is, you know, you project something on the white screen and then you, 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 you know, debate whether your idea is better or my idea is better or things like that. Uh, but then at some point, these guys ran out of white screens. And this, I, I guess, couple of pictures I wanted to show everyone just to uh, exemplify the creativeness that these guys have. So, so yeah, they are projecting on the ceiling, on doors, on the back of a chair, and so on, because they don't have any white screen. And believe me, some people ask me whether this was staged. No, this was not staged. This is the real thing happening. This is. This is exactly how 5G was created back in uh, uh, November 2017 in Reno. Okay, and last question I think, is 5G completed? Yes, it's completed. The release 15, uh, new radio specification developed by 3GPP is fully functional, and in fact, it has been commercialized. Uh, we are selling phones from Samsung that support uh, this 5G uh, radio interface, but no, it's not completed. So the first version of uh, the 5G is just a taste of fi what 5G will bring. So as I, I explained uh, earlier, 5G had a lot of visions, a lot of scenario, uh, 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 service scenarios. Those are still to be realized. Uh, and that will be the work that uh, 3GPP and myself will be doing over the course of the next couple of years. Okay, then initiative towards 6G. So before we go on, question number one is, what is 6G? What I can give you as an answer with certainty is, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea what 6G is. And I really doubt anyone has a definite answer at this point. So in order to uh, formulate what 6G is and define what 6G is, you need to have an understanding on the limitations of 5G first, but since 5G is now only starting its commercialization, it's kind of difficult to get there. Also, you need to know the latest demands from the market. What do they need? What's the additional thing they need? So right now, it's kind of fuzzy, to be honest. So what's this presentation on? So this presentation is on you know, early impression of what the factors might impact 6G. So some of them could impact 6G, some of them might not, let's see. So some buzzwords on 6G. I, th I think this is like a big list of uh, nice to have features. Note, some of them have been around since 4G. Some of them have been around for sure in 5G. And I'm pretty sure that not all of them will be uh, part of 6G. Some of, them, some of them will be, some of them will not be. It all depends on how mature the technology is, how, what's the demand from the market, and so on and so forth. 
But anyway, these are some of the buzzwords that we are currently hearing on uh, 6G. Okay, uh, some of the trends that we uh, expect for 6G. 6G for sure would be uh, wireless for machines. That would be the dominating, uh, dominating consumer of uh, wireless traffic. Uh, by 2030, it's expected that the number of uh, connected machines will be around 500 billion. This is about 57 times the human population. So there's no way that humans will be the main consumer of data at this point. Now, if you also look at the requirements or the boundaries that these machines have, it's uh, on a, another dimension from us. For a human, to consume wireless data, we can only consume this in one of five ways. Hear, see, uh, smell, touch, and taste, the five senses that humans have. But from a machine point of view, there's no boundary. It's actually, it only depends on how you implement the machine. So uh, this is one of the things. And then uh, we also are looking into the mobile device trend. Now, one thing we see especially uh, for uh, mobile devices, is the uh, battery and the computation power. Battery, over the course of nine years, has the capacity of batteries has improved by two times. However, I think everyone here can agree that your cell phone battery life has not increased that much. Now, I think it's quite kind of natural because uh, nothing's free, and I'm pretty sure you are now enjoying your cell phone's higher resolution, your applications are uh, you know, you know, uh, processing uh, much more than before. So although there's a two times increase in battery capacity, since you're processing more, you don't feel the difference in terms of battery life. Another thing uh, we see is, although the computation power of mobile devices has improved a lot, it's nowhere comparable to what a PC can uh, provide. Uh, for example, a mobile GPU only has 1 40th of the uh, computation power of a PC uh, GPU. And on top of that, the applications nowadays, they are getting more and more computation hungry. We have uh, new applications such as VR and later down the road, even maybe hologram, which you know, with mobile, G uh, mobile uh, processing power might be very difficult to uh, 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 serve. So this is another uh, trend we see for the 6G era. And, and as a natural consequence, this is one of the things that we think might happen, the convergence of computing and wireless. So instead of uh, having the terminal do the heavy lifting, why not have the uh, network do the uh, heavy lifting and then transfer only the necessary output from that processing to the terminal using the wireless link. So in this case, it would save a lot of processing power, which would also save a lot of battery uh, life for the uh, terminal. So this would provide uh, PC level performance uh, to uh, light devices by offloading heavy computation to the remote hardware. And then of course, for 6G, uh, I, I guess a new generation of wireless uh, uh, systems always bring about this discussion about new spectrum. And 6G is no different. And 6G, one of the hot uh, issues is this uh, move towards terahertz uh, band. Terahertz band is, uh, starts from 100 gigahertz to 10,000 gigahertz. The spectrum uh, in this uh, terahertz band is more than 100 times that 5G is currently using. So there's a lot of uh, uh, spectrum there. The bad news is, of course, even compared to millimeter wave, the channel propagation uh, properties are even worse. So the question is, how do we uh, bring about technology that can overcome this type of uh, adverse channel propagation uh, properties? And uh, the table to the right kind of uh, summarizes the usable, I mean, relatively usable uh, bandwidth in this terror. Uh, hertz uh, spectrum. Okay, so how will 6G take shape in the uh, coming years? So, in my experience, I, I, I have uh, 
been involved in the development of 3G, 4G, and 5G, and every generation is take, give or take 10 years. So 5G uh, was com commercialized this year in 2019, so I expect the first uh, commercialization of 6G to be around uh, uh, 2029. Now, during that time, these four things will happen. Initial research initiatives, these actually have already begun. Uh, you can uh, check the internet, you can also check with your colleagues, but you know, there are companies who have already started a very early research uh, on 6G. Now, after the companies are kind of confident about their research, what will happen is uh, companies will group together, sync up, and see if they match. Now, if they match, what they will start doing is they will try building up this consensus or momentum on 6G. That will take about two or three years. After that, they will bring this to uh, global standardization, which is basically ITU or 3GPP, and the work on the technical specifications will be initiated. Then that will take another, uh, I guess, uh, give or take three years. After that, we see the commercialization of 6G. So this is the overall uh, time plan that I think will be happening over the next uh, couple of years. And with that, I think I have ended my presentation and it seems I have now eight minutes left. If there's any uh, questions from the floor, I'd be happy to answer them.